And this is a big reason, if not the only reason, that 90% of us got into MPE to begin with. So this will be old news to a lot of us who made or otherwise acquired this sound as the first thing we did the moment our instrument arrived. But maybe I can catch someone before they drop $4,000 on Deckard's dream. And then maybe Junior will get to go to college after all. And I thought this would be a fun one to do because it will give me a chance to talk about analog synthesizers, which are very near and dear to my heart. And I kind of have an interesting relationship with everything we've been doing here. Because a synthesizer, in theory, can make any sound, and so it sort of has no, no character of its own. And as synthesizers continue to improve, they get closer and closer to that. Certainly with Surge, we can make a really wide variety of sounds, and we won't necessarily be able to identify that Surge is the synth we're using to make them. So that's the synthesizer as an abstract idea. But a lot of our synthesizers, particularly the early ones, particularly the analog ones, really do have a character of their own. And it's one that some of us like quite a bit, myself included. When we're working with something like Surge, and with MPE especially because of the expressiveness it adds, it's really easy to make something that sounds a lot like an acoustic instrument and not so much like a synthesizer. And so I thought today maybe we would look at some ideas for how we can make our synth sound more like a synth. And we'll be talking about some elements that are characteristic of the synthesizer sound and a couple things we can do to make Surge sound more analog in general. So let's talk just a little bit about the analog synth in question. This is the famous Yamaha CS80, and it is famously expensive and famously rare. I think there are about six of them left in the world in good working order. Four of them are owned by people who would like to get rid of them, but can't find a buyer who both has $100,000 and is willing to come pick it up. It does weigh like 200 pounds. And the other two are owned by Hans Zimmer. One of them he keeps in his Alpine Fortress, which is well nigh impenetrable and heavily guarded by armed snowmobiles and ski troopers. So you're probably not going to get that one. Uh, the other one he keeps on his yacht. The fast one, not the big one. And so who knows where that even is. Um, I'm not encouraging, advocating, or even suggesting any acts of piracy against Hans Zimmer. The whole point of this video is that, well, okay, assuming we already have an MPE controller, we don't need any expensive gear, and we can make these sounds with our free VST. So the CS80 was a little bit ahead of its time. But purely as a sound source, it's really nothing special compared to the Prophets and Jupiters and Junos and Oberheims that would soon follow. It has the same basic architecture and will make the same kind of sounds. What was really special about the CS80 was the polyphonic aftertouch, which allowed Vangelis to do all that really expressive playing on the Blade Runner soundtrack and others. And Vangelis is how you pronounce his name. I looked it up on the internet. And the internet would never lie. Although I may have not have been entirely truthful about the whereabouts of the current CS80s. So the polyphonic aftertouch was really pretty special. As is this little strip here. Which is a ribbing controller so you could slide your pitch up and down. So those things are cool. It may at one point have been worth ridiculous amounts of money, but, but now we have our MPE and we can do better. And in fact, we'll have to hamstring our instruments a little bit 
in order to authentically recreate this sound. So let's get started. The first thing we'll do is set up our controller and surge to match the CS80 as best we can. This first step is optional and temporary. I'm going to go to my instrument panel and I'm going to turn off the x-axis pitch. We'll turn it back on later, but I have a way I play my instrument and I'm very much in the habit of doing vibrato with finger wiggles and stuff like that, which is not how you would do it on the CS80. You'll do that instead with an LFO controlled by aftertouch. And it's just going to confuse me if I'm doing my manual vibrato the whole time. Next, let's load up our initial patch. Templates, thought foreign MP init. If you're new to this series, we set up that initial patch in the first episode. You don't really have to do that right now. Just um, load Surge's initial patch. And anytime I say pressure curve, just use the MPE pressure, and if I say velocity curve, just use the regular velocity. Now let's start with our filters. I'm going to set both of these to OBXD 12 decibel. And I'm going to set the cutoff in the middle. Uh, which filter you use is a matter of taste. I do believe the CS80 had a 12 decibel filter, but you can use whichever of them, whichever of these you like better. In theory, I like the OB better because I'm a real fan of the actual Oberheim filter. It's my favorite filter, except for the Pittsburgh. Uh, but in practice, I can't really tell the difference between these two filters. But I'm going to go with the OB. And next we have that quirk of the CS80 where each oscillator has its own filter. And we can set up Surge to do that in a couple steps. If we come up here to the filter configuration and click on D2, we will get our filters in parallel, which is what we want. And then down here in the mixer, we have these little switches underneath each channel. And if we switch oscillator 1 to filter 1 and oscillator 2 to filter 2. And while we're here, let's set both of these levels to minus 10 decibels or thereabouts and unmute track 2. And the CS80 had eight voices of polyphony. So let's just set our polyphony to eight. If it seems like we're limiting ourselves by turning down the polyphony and turning off our x-axis and all those things, we are. And you don't have to do that as general practice. Um, I just want to be as authentic as we can get what we learn to make this sound, and then we can take what we've learned to make whatever sounds we want in whatever ways we want. And this is a brass patch. So we'll stick to our rule of thumb that we use the sawtooth for brass. And also that's what that's what the Yamaha uses. Another limitation if you're wanting to do more stuff in the CSAD architecture, we have two waveforms available to us, the sawtooth and the pulse. No triangles, no signs. Now back to the subject of analog synths as instruments that have their own character, particularly the early analogs. I had a very difficult time staying perfectly in tune. The oscillators would drift in and out of tune over time. And we can do that with Surge. We have this parameter, oscillator drift. Let's hear what happens as I turn this up. 
we get some phasing effects as our oscillators are beating against each other because they're not exactly the same frequency. And while we're here, if we right click on this oscillator drift, we have this randomized initial drift phase, which is on by default, so we'll leave it on, but we should know that it's there. Um, if you turn that off, you can get your oscillators to sync up very precisely, which is sometimes useful for um, drum sounds and things like that. But there was no mechanism in the early analogs that would keep these two oscillators perfectly in sync. It was just dependent on their electronic components, how warm it was, quantum mechanics, things like that. So by randomizing that phase, we emulate that analog imperfection. Now, how high you want to turn this is going to be a matter of taste. I'm thinking this is probably too much. When I listen to the Blade Runner score, I can hear the oscillators phasing against each other, but they're not wildly out of tune. And the second thing we'll do is we'll adjust the pitch of these oscillators which will just add to that phasing effect. Let's just detune the second one. Put it up about 1.13 semitones. That might be too much, we'll see. And I say that the oscillators beating against each other is characteristic of the analog synth sound. It gives it that sort of shimmery effect. And it's also not something that is very commonly found on acoustic instruments. You will find it sometimes. You'll find that pianos can have their strings out of tune and they'll beat against each other. Or a 12-string guitar might be a little out of tune. And there are probably very clever mechanisms in a lot of Indian instruments to make that sort same sort of thing happen. So it's not unheard of in the acoustic world, but it was nearly unavoidable with the early analog synths. I missed a step. My oscillator one is being modulated by my pressure curve as the init patch does, but the oscillator two is not, so that's why it's really quiet. So for the moment, I'll just turn that up all the way. Now we should be able to hear the beating a little better. Which is pretty audible in the Blade Runner soundtrack. I'm using the main titles track as my reference. It's the one that starts with all the clicky noises and Harrison Ford talking as he studies a photograph with improbably high resolution. But I'm not going to play the actual music because, you know, I want to deal with copyright. We need to do a couple more things. Another quirk of the CS80 is that it has an envelope parameter called attack level, which we don't usually find in synths today. So we're going to use our trusty MSEG envelope to emulate that. So if I go down here to LFO4, set it to MSEG, set it to unipolar, loop mode on, And the thing about the attack level is that your sound can continue to increase in volume after the attack phase is finished. You get a weird shape like this. Now I'm going to rename this one Filter ENV. 
and I'm going to duplicate it, copy modulator, paste it into LFO5. Rename this one AMP ENV. And for both of these, I'm going to turn the amplitude all the way down and modulate that with velocity, the velocity curve. And let's use this filter ENV to modulate our filters. Bring it up yay high. I'm not going to be precise about the values I'm putting in here for the individual filters. They should be basically the same, but they should not be exactly the same. Because if we look back at our CS80, these are not precise controls. These sliders. So there's going to be a little bit of a difference between the two filters. Turn this cut off up a little bit more. Now, when I strike my key harder, I get more cut off. I will turn my uh, oscillators down to minus fifteen. and use my new amp envelope to bring back that five decibels. So that's our velocity set up. Now my pressure curve is already controlling the volume of these two oscillators. It's also going to control some amount of cutoff. I'm going to give it around 1500 hertz. This is doing the work of the famed polyphonic aftertouch. And getting these filter values right is going to play a big part in achieving the character of this particular sound. So I'm going to modulate them a little more with the pressure. But I'm also going to drag down their base values a bit. Now what you're looking for here in this sound is that moment where the filter kind of breaks into this brilliant tone. The filters should have a little bit of resonance too. Not a huge amount. So hearing the transition where it starts really singing with the filter might be easier after we do the next step. So most of the time in our MPE work, we've been avoiding low frequency oscillators. And we have all these down here, but we're just using them as things other than low frequency oscillators, using them as envelopes and curves. We do have, thankfully, one LFO left. And if we look at the CS80, 
we do only have one LFO that will act on both voices. And they call it the sub oscillator. And it has a speed and an amount which it controls the VCO, an amount which it controls the VCF, and the VCA. So pitch, filter, amplifier. The only one we're going to be using for this sound is the VCO. And if I go over here, we have our touch response. And here's where we get to program our rare and exquisite polyphonic aftertouch. And what we're going to do is use it to turn up the amount of the LFO and the speed of the LFO that we're applying to the pitch and that will achieve our vibrato. So I'm going to come pick LFO 6, and I'm going to modulate the pitch up to 20, 0.25 semitones. That's probably too much, but we'll fix it if we have to. While I'm here, I'm going to make sure this pitch of oscillator 1 is detuned 0.13 semitones. And oscillator 2 is detuned 0.11 semitones. That's wrong. I'm just going to reset the pitch on oscillator 1 to 0. We only need to detune one of the oscillators. I'm going to set the rate on this LFO. It can start at 1 hertz, that's fine. But I'm going to turn the amplitude all the way down. And then I'm going to modulate both of these with my pressure. I'll do about five and a half hertz for the rate. That will give us a maximum speed of 6.5 hertz, which I think is about as fast as I usually want a vibrato to be. And we'll modulate the amplitude with the pressure curve 99%. And I feel like that might be a little too much of the vibrato. It is, it is rather subtle in the recording. It's being expressive, but not madly so. So I'm going to turn down this amplitude modulation a little bit. And I'm doing it here. Let's do that 85%. I'm doing the modulation here so that I don't have to do the modulation twice on the pitch for each oscillator. Now I'm going to continue not playing the Blade Runner song, but I'll play something a little more like it. getting pretty close. I've made this uh, I've made this sound several times practicing for this. And most of the time what I spend most of the time doing is adjusting the filter. That's really I think the the key element of this sound. Do another important element of this sound, which is the reverb. Uh, I don't think the CS80 had a built-in reverb, but Vangelis did use some sort of reverb on it. And it was kind of huge. I'm gonna try the cathedral. Turn up the decay time. <laughs> 
Check out the size, the mix around 13%. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn the x-axis pitch back on. And I'm also going to have pitch quantize on, because that will be more keyboard-like. And now we can emulate that ribbon controller. Seems like the only thing he really did with the ribbon controller, at least in this part, was that big slide downwards. I find it a little tricky to do because it seems that like it loses a lot of the, the filter cut off as he's doing the slide because otherwise it would be like. It's usually not quite that bright, so I have to like reduce the pressure as I'm sliding down. Turn my cutoffs down some more. But add some more velocity modulation. If we remember, the velocity is controlling the filter envelope, it's not controlling the filter directly. And these filter settings probably change considerably over the course of the movie depending on which part he's doing. So it's not necessarily the case that your, your filter setup right now is going to work for all the parts as you studiously and laboriously and lovingly reproduce the entire score. Which is your homework. It's due on Thursday. Let me make use of this polyphonic aftertouch and lighten up on my pedal note as I play the melody. Okay, I think we're almost there. I just need a little more filter on from the pressure. There we go. Now we hear that breaking into brilliance that I was talking about. And also, I'm cheating now because I turned the pitch 
the x-axis pitch back on i'm doing manual vibrato which I think is really a better way to do it, but I wanted to, I wanted to do it the way it was done. I'll try now as I'm noodling to just rely on that aftertouch. Polyphonic aftertouch, vibrato, LFO. And let me do one more thing. Go over my second effect slot. Uh, this is not technically a part of an analog synth, just as the reverb isn't. Those early analog synths were most often recorded onto tape. And Surge gives us a pretty nice tape effect. So I'm going to go with this fattening preset. And turn the drive way down because it's way too much. <laughs> be careful not to play the third note because then I'm sure they'll get me. If we turn up the speed on our tape we'll get our brightness back. Turn the tone up as well because I think we're getting a low end howl kind of thing going on. Okay, we have one last detail. This is such a subtle thing that I didn't even notice it was missing, but it's an important classic synthesizer technique to know in general. And that is we're going to have a little pitch envelope at the start of our sound. So I'm going to go down here. We're not using our timbre curve. So I'm just going to rename this pitch envelope. Set it up as an envelope with zero sustain and a pretty short decay. And we're going to use this to modulate the pitch of both oscillators. Let's modulate it up one semitone. And always when you're programming a, an analog synth patch in a software synth, you want to look for opportunities where your oscillators can be a little bit different from each other. You're not going to necessarily do it every time, but it's something worth trying out. So the second oscillator is going to have just a little bit less modulation, 0.97. Yeah, so that that doesn't make a big difference in this sound, but it's uh, it's kind of the standard way of starting a brass sound. Gives it that little brassiness to the attack. So there we go. There's our basic Blade Runner brass. I'm going to go save that. So you probably noticed that this sound started sounding a whole lot more like Blade Runner the minute I added that reverb. That an analog synth 
just dry with no effects, can be a pretty harsh and not really pleasant sound. And that's why we add our modulations. We add our vibrato, our tremolos, we shape it with our envelopes. And a lot of the time we'll add effects. So if you're trying to capture the vibe of a particular era, there's a particular synth sound that you really love. Uh, it helps to know what kind of what kind of limitations they were faced with at the time and what kind of equipment and techniques they would use to overcome those. So when I'm making my classic synth patches, I will often slather on a tape echo. Cherry Audio makes a really nice plug-in, a Stardust, which is an emulation of the Roland Space Echo, which would have been widely used in the late 70s and early 80s. Sounds fantastic. It's a very inexpensive plug-in, I think it was. You might also study the kind of reverbs they had at the time. I'm guessing Vangelis used some fairly new and high-tech digital algorithmic reverb. If you were going back further in time, you might, might want to look into spring reverbs. And similarly, when we re reduced our polyphony to eight voices, that was again imposing on ourselves the limitations of the time period, because limitations will always shape your solutions and your ideas, and they can be very useful things in that way. And for more specific things on getting the analog synth sound, we do want to stick to our classic waveforms, some of which are listed in the modern category, but sawtooth, square, and triangle. Sometimes no triangle. That's the sort of waveform that you've had back then. And things like using an LFO to add modulation. Most of the time I don't want to do that with the MPE because I'm enjoying doing the MPE. But uh, an LFO vibrato will sound more classic synthy. I guess that's it. I'm going to go and make a Blade Runner inspired synth noodling video. That will be fun. Thanks for watching.